Welcome to AM Best Audio. Companies are on high alert as the number of cyber attacks rise. By 2025, the cost of cyber crime is predicted to grow to $10.5 trillion, according to cybersecurity ventures. While those incidents can potentially result in large financial losses for organizations, they can also drive significant indirect losses like reputational damage and security upgrade costs. I'm Lori Chortis for AMBEST TV. Cyber risk has increasingly become a boardroom issue, and companies need to put a host of cybersecurity and risk management measures in place, including cyber insurance, to protect their organizations from the risk of financial and reputational harm from these incidents, according to David Fins, first vice president in Alliance Cyber, and he's also author of the book, The Cyber Insurance Imperative. David joins us now to discuss that and other findings from his book. David, welcome. It's so great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Lori. Pleasure to be on here with you. David, can you tell us about your book, how the idea for it came about, and can you tell us about the information you included? I understand this is the second edition of the book. That's correct, Lori. So I've been in the insurance industry for about 19 years now, and I started focusing on cyber around 2014. And what I found is that there's a lot of misconceptions about the coverage that are held on the part of businesses. And so I wanted to address these, and that was my initial motivation for writing the book. The second edition came about as a result of the heightened awareness around security controls uh, that followed the ransomware epidemic and also the need for businesses to keep their coverage um, in in pace with the changing threat landscape. As we see rising frequency and sophistication of cyber attacks on companies today, what's driving that? What factors are contributing to that? Well, you know, Lori, a a lot of this is attributable to the fact that during the pandemic, uh, many employees started working from home and that essentially increased the attack surface for organizations because that remote access, you know, provided additional opportunities for threat actors to get into networks and to compromise them. Additionally, we have seen the rise of something known as ransomware as a service. This is essentially where these ransomware syndicates um, lend out the tools of the trade to businesses that are, you know, going after some of these organizations and then keeping a share of the profits. And now more recently, we've seen uh, through the use of artificial intelligence, the rise of deep fakes and more sophisticated phishing emails. So all of this is keeping information security professionals on their toes. Absolutely. And how does the rise in these attacks impact organizations' overall financial health and also their operational efficiency? Well, clearly organizations are spending more on cybersecurity, right? This is something they can no longer ignore because the cost of not being proactive can be staggering. Uh, Ideally, information security professionals like CISOs should be seen as an ally to folks in the boardroom and the C-suite where they can go to the CISO and say, this is what we'd like to do. How can we go about this in a way that keeps our network secure, protects our data assets, and allows us to be competitive, right? Rather than seeing the CISO as an obstacle or an impediment to the organization's mission. Can you tell us a little bit more about how cyber attacks affect customer trust and companies' reputation? And what measures can business leaders take to rebuild trust after an incident? Well, what I have found working with a lot of organizations who have been victims of cyber attacks is that consumers can be very forgiving when they see that a company has been attacked. What they're less forgiving about is when the company mishandles the incident response. And that's why it is so important that businesses have a plan to communicate with each other and with their stakeholders following an event to you know, restore that trust and make sure that Uh, employees, consumers, shareholders are all aware of what measures are being taken to restore the network, to protect data assets, and to get the company uh, back online. One of the ways that companies can do this is to essentially run a dress rehearsal known as a tabletop exercise. And apart from the technical aspects of running such an exercise, one of the things that gets 
fleshed out, if you will, is how the organization is going to communicate internally and externally during a crisis and how decision making will take place, given the fact that their normal lines of communication may be compromised due to a threat actor being in the network. So how are companies adapting their cybersecurity measures to counteract the rise of these attacks? Well, there are so many measures that companies can take now to secure their network and data assets. And these are the questions that underwriters will be asking during the cyber insurance application or renewal process. Uh, some of these, and there's just too many to list here, uh, include deploying multi-factor authentication, uh, conducting penetration penetration testing on a company's network, uh, data encryption, privilege access management, having a plan for addressing end-of-life software. This is software that's no longer being serviced by the developer. Um, having a regimen around third-party risk management, making sure that they thoroughly vet the vendors, the service providers that they are using, uh, particularly when there's sensitive data being handled. But also importantly, overlaying all of this is integrating cyber insurance into their incident response planning. And what about for insurers? How are insurers responding to the rise of cyber attacks and what role does cyber insurance play in a company's overall risk management strategy? Well, the underwriters have become much more astute in recent years. Uh, they are employing risk engineers during the application process, they are conducting non-invasive vulnerability scans of an organization's network. And now none of this guarantees that a company won't have an incident, but what the insurers are looking to do is partner with their policyholders, with the insureds, um, giving them intel around critical vulnerability exploits that need to be addressed. Some of the companies, some of the carriers we deal with are even offering risk mitigation incentives to their policyholders so that if they are deploying a new control, a new upgrade to some security, that they may be eligible for to defray a portion of the cost associated with that control. And, you know, it's sort of like a defensive driving discount for businesses that want to enhance their security. And so there's, there's more of a partnership uh, around the process of helping insureds uh, improve their cyber maturity and reduce the likelihood or the potential severity of an attack. Customize your data experience. Best Link now offers an interactive company dashboard that provides company level intelligence in a fast, user-friendly interface featuring interactive tables, charts, and sparkline performance histories. Customize the dashboard tiles to prioritize the insurer ratings, data, and analytics that best support your workflow. AM Best. Our insight, your advantage. When you look at cyber insurance, how has it matured in recent years to address new areas of risk? And are you seeing more companies today considering or purchasing the coverage? So cyber insurance has developed in waves, if you will. Now, uh, back in the 2000s and the early 2010s, some of the early adapters of this coverage were companies with large quantities of data banks, retail, hospitality, and data breaches were really the focus of the coverage. Over time, however, as the threat environment has evolved, the coverage has grown with it to encompass business interruption loss, cyber extortion, and more recently, electronic crime in all its various forms, fraudulent transfer of funds, social engineering, uh, invoice manipulation, crypto jacking, which is essentially uh, utilizing an organization's uh, electrical or computing power to mine for cryptocurrency. And so the first party coverage has really expanded to provide more of a comprehensive solution. On the third party side of the ledger, as we have seen the proliferation of data privacy uh, regulations, uh, as well as some attempts on the part of uh, consumers and employees to launch class actions, we've seen the importance of the third-party coverage develop as well. Over the years, there have been some myths and misperceptions surrounding cyber insurance. Can you tell us about some of those and can you help us debunk some of these common myths? 
Well, Lori, there's just so many of them. And as I alluded to earlier, that's part of the reason that I wrote the book. Um, You know, one common misconception is that cyber insurance doesn't pay claims. I can assure you uh, that having personally handled many six, seven and even eight figure claims and recoveries for my clients, uh, that that is clearly not the case. Where that misconception seems to have arisen from is an attempt by some businesses over the years who either didn't purchase cyber insurance or didn't purchase enough cyber insurance to attempt to trigger coverage under another policy that wasn't really originally designed for that purpose, whether it was general liability or property. And this is a phenomenon that the underwriters refer to as silent, uh, brokers might call it non-affirmative cyber coverage. Uh, In recent years, however, the underwriters have really attempted to tighten up their language and to try to wall this risk off into its own dedicated line of coverage. But a lot of the bad press around cyber insurance really arose out of attempts by these businesses to trigger coverage under these other policies. And if you don't read past the headlines, you might have the impression that they purchased a cyber insurance policy that the carrier wasn't willing to pay on a valid claim. Um, Another myth that seems to have developed is that brokers are encouraging their clients to purchase insurance instead of investing in cybersecurity. Now, I can tell you that we would never do that. A responsible broker would never encourage a business to shortchange their cybersecurity. And more importantly, the underwriters would not want to offer terms. They would not want to quote that risk any more than you would want to see your client spend uh, money on fire insurance and not invest in sprinkler systems or conduct fire drills. Um, Our approach has always been to secure your network and data assets to the extent that you are able and then recognizing that it can never be 100% foolproof to transfer the remaining portion uh, of the risk. And so cyber insurance is really intended as a backstop, not a substitute for good cyber hygiene. But the myth that is really the most unfortunate, I think, is when a business believes that they are too small to be the victim of a cyber attack, that they wouldn't be on the threat actor's radar. Unfortunately, a lot of businesses have found out that everyone is a target and that it's only after they've had an event do they realize the necessity uh, for the coverage. And of course, at that point, the damage is done and it may be harder for them to actually qualify, but we're here to assist them. What role do risk advisors play in aiding companies navigate the new reality of cyber liability? Right. So insurance brokers who want to get involved in cyber coverage really need to go beyond the insurance transaction, right? Uh, Initially, when we work with a client, we want to assess the cyber maturity uh, of their regimen and also quantify the risk. You know, what keeps them up at night? What are their most sensitive assets? What is it that we are trying to protect? And what is the likely outcome of an event in terms of insuring it, much like you would insure against uh, a hurricane, right? What, how much limits do I need to survive the one in 100 or the one in 200 storm, if you will? We also believe in connecting our clients with service providers who can help them get the necessary controls into place. So if we identify that there is a deficiency in their controls, we have strategic partnerships with vendors that we have vetted and that can come in and help enhance their cybersecurity. Um, And, you know, personally, my my, uh, swim lane, if you will, is around negotiating the policy wording and assisting them when they have a claim. So the coverage and the claims are, you know, really essentially why folks buy the coverage. And so we want to make sure that the policy is fit for purpose and that it performs when they do have a loss. And David, what do you hope readers will take away from your book? Well, that cyber insurance is an integral part of the overall risk management and cybersecurity regimen of an organization. It's another tool in the toolkit. Again, as I indicated, it is not a substitute for having good cybersecurity, but it is a backstop for those events when an organization has a loss. And ideally, they should see the insurance as a sort of gut check when they go through the underwriting process to help assess whether there are any areas where they're coming up short 
and we can assist them in getting the necessary controls into place uh, so that they can present themselves to the underwriters in the best possible light. David, this has been so informative. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks, Lori. Thanks for having me on. That was David Finns, first vice president in Alliance Cyber and author of the book, The Cyber Insurance Imperative. For AMS TV, I'm Lori Chortis. Looking to get the full attention of the insurance industry? We have the platforms that will do just that. Whether it be AM Best TV, AM Best Audio, Best Review Magazine, or Best Day. Find out more by calling AM Best Advertising Sales at 908 439 2200, extension 5399, and have a great day.